I'm Professor Clements. Today we're going to try to figure out how to use the equilibrium constant to find concentrations of reactants and products after equilibrium has been obtained. So we have a problem up there, you can see it on the screen, and what we've done is we have a reaction, we've been given something about the reaction, so we have an equilibrium constant, and we have some initial moles here and also a volume. Now, of course, we know that the equilibrium constant, everything's done in molarity and concentration, so we know that one of the first things we're going to be doing is converting those, or those mole values to concentration. So let's do that first. We're going to find out the initial concentration of CO, and that's going to be 1.50 moles of CO divided by my 8.00 liters. And if I do that number, I get 0 0.1875 molar. Now, if you're paying attention to the sig figs, which is always a good idea to pay attention to sig figs, right? I have one extra one here, but that's OK. We don't mind having an extra sig fig in the middle of calculations, since it's all going to be multiplication and division. We're going to find our initial concentration of H2, and that's going to be our 4.50 moles, also over our 8.00 liters. And if you get that number, it's 0 0.5625 molar H2 and molar CO, going back up to fix that one. Okay, so now we have these initial concentrations. What are we going to do with them? Well, when we are on a Custis problem where we have some sort of initial concentrations, we have a value of the equilibrium constant, we're going to put together an ice table. Remember that stands for initial change in equilibrium. So I'm going to go ahead and do that here. I'm going to scroll this up a little bit. And I'm going to write my reaction. So my reaction again is CO, and I'm going to react it with 3H2 to make CH4, methane, and H2O. Now when I'm writing the ice table, I don't worry too much about my phases and things like that, so I'm just leaving them off for now. Because the important part is what we're actually trying to do here, which is our initial, our change, and our equilibrium concentrations. Those are the important things. So we have our equal initial concentrations. We just calculated those. That's 0 0.1875 molar and 0 0.5625 molar. And then we have to ask, well, what are the other ones? The other one's going to be 0 because we weren't told we had any. So we know those initial concentrations are 0. Now, what's going to happen as we run this reaction? Well, as we run this reaction, what's going to happen is we are going to make methane and we are going to make water. But at the same time, we're also going to be using up carbon monoxide and using up hydrogen. So we got to keep that in mind as we're going. So and that's what we do in that change row, is we figure out how are, thing, how are things changing. And we just do that with stoichiometry. And we just make up a number. Well, how much is the reactor going to run? I don't know. It's going to run x. Which way is it going to run? Well, this one's easy. There's no products, so we know we have to form products. We can't run the reaction in reverse, because there's no products to run in reverse. So let's just say we're going to produce x products. Well. Stoichiometrically, if I produce x CH4s, I'm also going to produce x waters. And stoichiometrically, the ratio is 1 to 1 on CO, carbon monoxide, and methane. So I'm going to be using up x of that. So it's going to be a minus x there. And what about for H2? Well, here, right, the stoichiometry says I need 3 H2s for every carbon monoxide. So I'm going to put a minus 3x here. I'm going to be using up 3 of those H2s every time I use up a carbon monoxide. The E line is the easiest line. You just add up the I and the C, right? Your initial, your change, you add those up together. So I get 0 0.1875 minus x, 0 0.5625 minus x, x, and x. And again, you notice I'm not even putting the molars in anymore. I like to put it in that first line, but you know, just to save a little bit of time, people often forget it there. It's important to put it somewhere, though, because sometimes we do things in millimoles in these tables. And we want to make sure that we know we're doing things in molarity. So I've got this table here. And uh, unfortunately, I'm going to scroll it out under my picture there in a moment. But then what do we do next? Well, we've got an equilibrium constant, which tells us on that E line, when we're at equilibrium, it tells us what is our concentrations at equilibrium. So we can write the expression for the equilibrium constant here for this reaction, K is going to be the concentration of CH4 times the concentration of H2O divided by the concentration of CO and the concentration of H2 
raised to that third power. It's a thing that people often forget is to actually put that power of 3 there. That's the form of our equilibrium constant. And we were given a number for that. That was just given in the problem statement as 4.87 times 10 to the minus 4. And we notice that number is fairly small. What does that mean? Our product concentration is going to be relatively low at equilibrium. Right? If it's product over reactants, we get a small number. It means the numerator is small, the denominator is large. Well, what does that mean about our reaction? It means it's not going to run very far. It's not going to go to the right very much. It's not going to make a lot of product. What does that tell us? It tells us that x is likely to be very small, and we'll use that in just a moment. So let me go ahead and substitute into that k expression those values that I just found in the e line of my ice table. So CH4 was simply x. H2O was simply x. CO was 0 0.1875 minus x. And h2 was 0 0.5625 minus 3x. And again, what people forget a lot of the time here is to put that cube on there. I've got to have that cube there because my equilibrium expression says concentration of h2 cubed. OK, so I've got that there. Now, if you were to try to write that out, oh my goodness, would that be difficult? Because you've got a cube there, you've got a square. A th I mean, it, it would be a fourth order polynomial, and I don't like solving fourth order polynomials. They're hard to do. So what we do oftentimes is we make an assumption. As I said earlier, we said, well, the reaction's not going to run very far to the right. It's not going to produce a lot of products. So let's go ahead and make an assumption. We are going to assume that x is small, and specifically that x is much, much less than 0 0.1875. Why is that important? Well, if I take something much smaller and subtract it off, it's insignificant, right? If I take 0 0.001 and I subtract it from 100, is it going to make a difference? Not really. So if I can assume that x is pretty small, then when I take 0 0.1875 minus x, I'm just going to get 0.1875. So 0 0.1875 minus x is approximately 0 0.1875. Five, and that is going to save me in that equation there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those that k equation and I'm going to put my assumption in. So now I've got k is x squared. I just took those two x's and combined them, times 0 0.1875. Right? I took away the minus x because I assumed it was small. Now what about the 0.5625? Well, if x is less than 0.18, it's also less than 0.56. And so I'm going to make that assumption as well. And so I've got 0 0.5625, again, cubed. These cubes and squares are really hard to remember to leave in every time. Well, that looks a whole lot easier. That's 4.87 times 10 to the minus 4th. That looks a whole lot easier to solve, because now I've just got x squared over a number is equal to a number. Now, I'm not going to show you all the math that's involved in that. You're going to multiply out the denominator, make sure to cube the 0.5625, multiply it out over on the right. And what you get is that x squared is 1.625 times 10 to the minus fifth. Okay, So that tells us the value of x squared. We're going to take the square root of both sides in order to find the value of x. And we get that x is plus or minus 1, whoops, not 1, let me erase that, 0 0.00403 molar. Okay. Now, plus or minus, because we get the square root, which one is it? Well, it's got to be plus in this case, because we said the reaction was running to the right, and that's all, what, all it could do, so it's got to be a plus. So we're just going to keep the plus one. So we now know. Right? If we look back up at our, our table here, I'm going to scroll back up. We now know the value of x here, right there. We know that x. And so we know that the concentration of CH4 and the concentration of H2O is that 0 0.004, okay? because that was our x. So the concentration oops, of CO and the concentration of H2O was equal to x, and that's going to be 0 0.00403 molar. Well, 
what about the other two? Okay, the other two, now that's funny, right? My battery is dying, so hopefully uh, it lasts here. So what about the other two? Well, we have to figure those out. We have some math for them. And so we knew that the concentration of CO was 0 0.1875 minus X. And if you do that, that's 0 0.183 molar, right? It didn't change the value of CO very much, which is what we assumed back at the beginning. Now, we really want to quantify that assumption and make sure that our assumption is correct. Let me go ahead and calculate this other one. The concentration of H2 is going to be 0 0.5625 minus 3x. And if you do that, you get 0 0.550 molar. Again, not a big change. So how do you quantify whether our assumption was good? Well, what you do to check the assumption, right, our assumption was that x was much, much less than 0.1875. So we're going to compare that. We're going to compare x to 0 0.1875 as a percentage. And if you do that, you get that it's 2.1%. And that's fine. 2.1% is an okay assumption. It's not perfect. It means the value of x is going to be a little bit off, but not by very much. Okay, so 2.1%. Anything less than 5%, we're okay. If we get more than 5%, we've got to do some other things, and hopefully at some point I'll have another video for that. Okay, so here we go. We've actually got our answers here. We know all of those equilibrium concentrations. We found them there, and we also know that our assumption is good. And so we have now solved this and found those equilibrium concentrations. So go ahead, do your homework, have fun, and hope this video helped. Thanks.